All right, guys. So this one is about the uh, the neurophysiology, the beginning of the neurophysiology. So we will start to talk about the uh, the neuronal cells, neural cells. And this is where we, uh, if you're interested, this is uh, the material that you can, you can find uh, the concept in more depth. Okay, so in today's lecture, we will talk about, we will kind of overview the cells in the nervous system. So we will describe the major cells, which is the neuronal cells. And with that, we will also talk about the neurotransmitter. There are more than 50 type of neurotransmitters. Uh, that's important mediator between for the neural communication. We talked about one neurotransmitter earlier in the muscle system, that's the acetylcholine. So we kind of know that what's going on over there. So with this one, we will describe an overview of these major neurotransmitter, including acetylcholine, and how they function in different regions. We will also talk about the receptor. The receptor is important that receptor defines the function, the effects, the effects of that neurotransmitter. So same neurotransmitter can have different effects. We learned about that uh, in the sympathetic nerve system, right? The norepinephrine can cause vessel dilation in the coronary artery, but vessel constriction in some other vessels. The difference is because they act on different uh, different receptors. So that's one good example. And then, uh, so we will talk about the excitatory and the inhibitory uh, neuro, uh, the uh, uh, inference is uh, from the neurotransmitter from the receptor. And then we will also talk about this. There are two types of the receptor, anotropic and uh, metabotropic. So that's the neurons. And then we will talk about the other big group of the cells in the nervous system, these are called the glial cells. There are three types of glial cells. Uh, the myelin cells, probably the most uh, well aware the cells. These are myelin wrapped around the axons. Uh, there are two types. Oligodendrocytes is the myelin cell in the central nervous system, including the spine and the spinal cord. Schwann cells are myelin cells in the peripheral nervous system. So that's myelin cells. We also have the astrocytes and uh, microglia. So these are totally different from the neuronal cells. Not saying that they are not important. They are in fact very important. Neuronal cells basically is the one to conduct the signal conduction, but to maintain the function of a neuronal cell, we need healthy glial cell. A lot of disease is because of, a lot of disease causing the neural disorder is not because of the neuronal no cell, it's because of the glial cells. So we will learn about that. All right, so first, first, neuronal cells. So this is a typical neuronal cells. The unique about the neuronal cell compared to other cells is its morphology. So neuronal cell has very, uh, like a, a very, uh, very diverse processes. Uh, we, as you can see here, is is like a, a tree branches in a way that we have the many branches, okay? Here we call it processes. We talk about one process when we talk about the puddle size, right? So you kind of get the idea that this is an extension from the cell body. It's part of the cell, it's just the extension from the cell body. All right, so here we have the soma, that's a cell body, and the extension is dendrites and axon. Dendrites is one to receive signal. Axon is one to deliver signal. 
So basically that when there is an action potential, action potential will, when there is signal coming into the cell, they will come into the dendrites and the soma. Here is a region we receive signal. And then the signal will cause an action potential. The action potential usually occur in the axon helix or initial segment of the axon. And that will travel along the axon to the axon terminal. So that's that. So here is showing you that in the dendrites and the soma, we have the region called spines. So we have the somatic spine and the dendritic spine. Here is the soma, you have the spines. And the dendrites, we have the spines. But we don't see the spine in the axon. These spines represent the post-synaptic site. So here is the synaptic conduction. This one is the axon terminal from the other neuronal cells. They reach out to form a synaptic conduction with another cell. That's another cell. And uh, that synaptic conduction always conduct in the dendrites and the soma, but not the axon. All right. So if you have the imaging and uh, asking you that which one, which dendrite, which is this uh, process is, is axon, you need to find one doesn't have the spines on it. So that's the one right here. I don't know, maybe you guys do uh, histology in your pathological classes, right? And uh, you probably ask, got, ask uh, to identify the axon in a, in a histology. Find the one that doesn't have the spine on it. That is the axon. These spines are important because these spines represent the synaptic conduction. There is a spine, there is a synaptic conduction. These spines can become big, represent an enlarged synaptic conduction, or it becomes small or even disappear. So here is the spine. Here you can see that this is the spine. Spine is the post synaptic site. Here is the pre. So very typical that action potential travel down here, release the neurotransmitter. There are different kinds of neurotransmitter binds on the receptor and uh, causing the transmitter signal to the post-synaptic site. This may, may seem new here, but we have something similar in the neuromuscular junction, right? So here is the motor neuron. This neurotransmitter is the acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction. And the receptor is the NACHR. So that's very typical, very similar, like what we see here in the nervous system. There's something different between these two. One is that in the muscle, each muscle only has one innervation, but in the nerve, we have multiple innervation. So that's huge difference. Muscle, you don't have uh, many nerve to excite one muscle. You have one nerve to excite multiple muscles. It's called the motor unit. And uh, here in the nerve, we have multiple nerve excite single muscle. Uh, sorry, single cells, single neuronal cells. So these uh, these spines are are represent the uh, the synaptic conduction, and uh, they can become big, become small, become disappeared. And this is very dynamic. So here is uh, by counting or by identifying these spines, we basically can identify the process of the neural. Plasticity. So neuroplasticity is something that the uh, physio that is the functional change as well as the morphological change. So these two basically uh, work side by side in the nervous system. So say say that uh, uh, say that do you guys remember what what you're doing over the weekend? You guys remember, right? It's not like a blank, right? It's not like totally blank you remember something. So how can you remember it? 
how can you remember what you're doing over the weekend? That is because that is wired. That circuit is wired. So you basically link these together. Say you say you hang out with your brother, right? That's what you do, what you did over the weekend. So you have a memory of your brother. And you have the say uh warma, right? In your brain or it's a new warma, but you have something linked like in Loma Linda somewhere, right? So you have that. And uh, you just did a link these two together and uh, link it to the date or time when it happens. So you have those individual events in the brain. You have that memory. What you do is to create that connection. So you, you kind of have that memory that that's your brother, that's what you did, and you probably remember what he talked and what's was the fun part of it, something like that. So that's a circuit. So whenever you generate a memory, you generate a circuit. And that circuit is basically is formed by these spines. Enhanced, enlarged spine, enlarged synaptic conduction, uh, enlarged uh, receptor, the amount of the receptor in that postsynaptic site. So that is the dynamic. That's how dynamic your spines, uh, your uh, your uh, dendritic spine or somatic spine create or diminish during during like minutes or seconds. All right, you you basically remember things right immediately after that thing happens, and uh, you basically generate that spine that enhance that spine, create that connection. This could die. This connection, if you don't reinforce it, it will disappear eventually, and then you forgot. But you can practice. So memory, basically, by two mechanisms. Memory can be formed by two mechanisms. One of it is repetition. You guys know that, right? So for example, you do your uh, DPT maneuver, the more you do it, the better you memorize it. That's right here. So the more you do it, you create that circuit. And that circuit will be reinforced every time you repeat it. So that's that. So that is a spine. Now, when we look at nerve, right, we, re we see we see that this is the uh, EM. You can see that a lot of exon terminal reach out to generate a synaptic conduction with a cell right here. It could be on the so soma, on the dendrites. And uh, so you can see that there are a lot. And here showing you that this synapse can be excitatory and can be inhibitory. So let's take a look. What are these? And this excitatory and inhibitory uh, synapses is not depends on the neurotransmitter. It depends on the receptor. So the, here we have the excitatory and the inhibitory synapses. And uh, 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 depends on the receptor. So what are the receptor making it an excitatory or an inhibitory uh, effects. So the excitatory synapses are the receptor which cause an ion channel to allow to open for the ion of sodium of Na plus or Ca2 plus. So these are common one. If this receptor is a ligand gated ion channel, for example, and opens up uh, sodium or calcium, then what happens is that once it's open, sodium is more higher, you know, higher amount, higher concentration in the extracellular space they will flow into the postsynaptic site. 
and that will cause an excitatory effect. Same thing with the calcine. Once it's open, calcine will flow in, causing an excitatory effect. So that is the then 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 that will bring up the memory potential because these are the positive charge ion, and that lead to the depolarization. And that's the excitatory synapses. On the other hand, we may have the inhibitory. Say we open up, uh, it's typically caused by the opens of the chori. Chori is a negative charge ion. So, uh, so say this is the post nervous side. Say this is a post, say this is a post nervous side. Right, so this is a positive website, and uh, uh, and if you opens up a, uh, if you opens up a, uh, if you opens up, right? if you opens up a calcium channel. What's gonna happen? If this happens to be a calcium channel, if this happens to be a calcium channel, what's gonna happen? Because in the cell, we have more calcium. That's why I keep for enforcing that you must, must keep this in mind that the ion concentration different between intracellular and extracellular. The only thing different is the calcium, which is higher. The only thing that you need to memorize is calcium is higher in the cells. All right, so, and that is caused by the sodium potassium ATPS. So that was the first lecture, first week lecture, right? All right, so we have that. So once we open up calcium channel, what's gonna happen? Calcium is high concentration in the cell, it will flow out. Calcium are positive charge ion, so it will make the memory potential to become more negative. It's called the hyperpolarization so basically that will make it more negative, the entire environment to be more negative, entire memory potential to be more negative. And that basically causes the inhibitory, it's less to be excited. And if we go back, apply this picture here. Say here we opened up sodium channel, right? What's gonna happen? Uh, extracellular versus intracellular, where do we see higher concentration of sodium? Extracellular, right? So once sodium channel opens, sodium will flow in. And that's positive charge ion will make the memory potential to become more positive. And uh, so that will become over threshold trigger and action potential. So that will make it excited. So that's depolarization and it's an excitatory synapses. This potential, ch this channel change allow ion to flow in or out to change the memory potential. If it's excited, excitatory, we call it EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential. And uh, is this equal to the action potential? Not exactly, right? Because we have the idea that we build that concept earlier, like amplitude potential. Amplitude potential is the open of the ligand gated ion channel, ligand gated sodium channel, the NACHR. And it's not the action potential yet. It just provides the stimulus. If that's higher than the threshold, then it triggers action potential. Here, the same thing. We have the neurotransmitter. Uh, it depend, it's really depending on the circuit. This neurotransmitter binds on it. So this is, again, a ligand gated ion channel. And uh, very much like uh, an ACHR, ACH, sorry, acetylcholine binds on it. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter, binds on it, opens up ion channel. And so this change in the muscle, we call it the end period potential. Here we call it an EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential. So that's that. And if it's inhibitory, we induced an IPSP, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So that's that. 
So the type of the receptor, uh, they are excitatory, inhibitory. That's one way to distinguish these two, to, dis to classify these two uh, different group of receptor. There is another way to classify this receptor. It's called, uh, uh, there are two groups. So it can be the ionotropic or the metabotropic. So this is uh, classified by whether they are ion channel or not. So ionotropic receptor are the receptor serve as an ion channel, like this one here, like this one here. This is an ion channel. So receptor is an ion channel. However, there is a situation that the receptor is not an ion channel. For example, like this one here. Neurotransmitter binds on it. This is post-synaptic site. It's not an ion channel. It causes a response. So it's very much like uh, a phone call, right? So you call someone. And uh, so uh, someone on the other hand will do something. They don't come here to open the door because you, you call them, they don't open the door. On the other hand, it could be the door, uh, doorbell, right? Like this one could be the doorbell. Like you ring it and it open the door, the channel open. So that's the anotropic. If it doesn't come with the ion channel, it's not the anotropic. It's called a metabotropic receptor. So there are two types. Once ionotropic neurotransmitter directly gets an ion channel, this is also called neurotra neuro neurotransmitter gated ion channel or ligand gated ion channel. So that's the one that we see many, many times NACHR, et cetera, et cetera, right? And here, another type. This is also very common. And this is common in a way that um, that's related. Uh, to the uh, a lot of uh, cellular uh, reaction. It's not just open channel, they cause a lot of cellular reaction. So the effects is more, more profound in a way, more profound. So this is called the metabotropic receptor. Neurotransmitter does not directly gate, does not directly gate an ion channel but act through second messenger system. So these metabotropic receptors are uh, also known as the G-protein coupled receptor, GPCR, because their process is processed through G-protein. So let's look at, look at what's happening here. So this is the G-protein coupled receptor. So this one, we have the G-protein. Uh, so these effects are usually prone because it's not just open channel, open and close, that straightforward. This one triggers something, this will trigger further stuff. So this is usually prone compared to the ionotropic receptor. Now let's look at why is G-protein, what you need to know about the G-protein. The G protein couple receptor is a big group of the uh, of the uh, receptor, neurotransmitter receptor. So there are a lot of story to talk about. However, we don't have that much of time here, right? We only probably have one day to talk about everything. So you just need to know one thing. That's it. Okay. So that's so that's that is just this side. That's this size you need to know. And what you really need to know is that three components, alpha, beta, gamma. Alpha, beta, gamma. That three components you need to know, okay? g protein has how many components? One, two, three, four, five, six, three. What's our three? Alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay, so that's the first thing you need to know. Second thing is you need to know is that which one is the activator? Is the alpha. Alpha is the activator. So beta and gamma, not that important. Not that important compared to the alpha. They are also important, but not as important as the alpha. And uh, the, the effect is that once neurotransmitter 
binds on it. Alva will bind on GTP to, be, to become activated. So Alva with GTP is one that is activated. Alva with GTP move to the cytosol cause a lot of defects. Alva with GDP is one that's not activated. So once they finish the work, they will release to bind with GDP and everything return to normal. So that's that. What are the effects? Effects has several. Uh, it could be an open an ion channel, you know, like a close but not immediate. Uh, nearby but not directly controlled by the uh, neurotransmitter. They could activate several cellular uh, signal uh, pathways through say C, AMP, C, GMP. They can activate intracellular or memory enzyme and so to promote several processes. They can uh, activate a gene transcription, so that can cause the cell to produce more protein, specific type of protein, because gene transcription to form new protein. Yes, here we go. Gene expression in a way. So several. This one give you a video understanding of what's going on here. So say you don't have the receptor right here. And this is a typical uh, GPCR, G protein couple receptor. And uh, uh, once it binds on it, the alpha, alpha will release its GDP replaced with, uh, re uh, replace GDP with GTP, three phosphate. Yes, GDP diphosphate. Then this alpha with GTP are the one activated, causing several effects. Here chose show you four, the one that we mentioned earlier. It could be flowed into the near channel to open the channel, and that can cause the IPSP or EPSP. It could activate an enzyme. It could trigger an enzyme again, and it can cause gene transcription and produce the proteins and the uh, structural change of the cell. So, so it will be more prolonged effects, right? So say, yeah, so, so that's that. So you need to memorize that. You need to know that. Now you will know that the receptor has two type, ionotropic and uh, metabotropic, two types. And uh, in each type, we can have an IPSP or EPSP, right? In this case, like this case, this is the, if it opens an ion channel and this ion channel happens to be a potassium channel, then this is an IPSP or EPSP. Is this an excitatory or inhibitory? See, potassium flow out, right? So an opening of a potassium channel causing IPSP, causing inhibitory effects, because the memory potential become more negative, causing hyperpolarization. All right, so that is the receptor. Right, so we best know everything now. Here we are looking into some spatial receptor. Here I list you several commonly seen receptor. Uh, the idea is to give you every one of these. <laughs> uh, but I will, you know, not everyone, not, not, not detailed though. Acycholine, we talked about it already in the neuromuscular junction, right? We also talk about it in the peripheral, sorry, in the parasympathetic nerve system. This acycholine is the neurotransmitter of the uh, parasympathetic 
nervous system to act on the heart. You probably see this in your <laughs> in your quiz or final or midterm, right? Yeah. So you know that. So I say calling X on in the in the muscle, skeletal muscle, or in the heart muscle, those are all peripheral. These are also part of the neurotransmitter brain. This is important to regulate, to affect our, our memory, our attention. So that's the essay calling. And that evolved, yeah, so that's that. Glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter. We will spend a lot of time talk about these two in the following lecture. We will focus on these two because these two have many interesting story uh, relevant to uh, to the clinical and as well as the uh, uh, physical therapy, okay, as well as GABA. We will also talk about GABA. GABA is the major inhibitor. So this one is a major excitatory. This one is the major inhibitor neurotransmitter. Their function cause inhibitory. We have this other serotonin affects all mood. So uh, like uh, we probably know this through these two. Serotonin, dopamine, this affects our mood. They are neurotransmitter in the brain. Their circuits is more, is a little bit more like, it's, it's more profound. I mean, like more like affects many regions in the brain. Uh, these two affects our our mood. Serotonin, dopamine, dopamine also uh, involve our movement. Uh, later, when we talk about the basal ganglia, we will talk about the dopamine, and that affects our our movement move, movement. Neuroepinephrine is also important to affect our attention. It's part of the sympathetic, right? So we are ready to fight or flight. So that's that. So we will use this acetylcholine as an example to show you something quite important, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter we can see, we can find as we already study it a lot in the uh, muscle. We didn't study it a lot. We mentioned about it, but here we will complete that story, the neuromuscular junction. It's also part of the, it's also the neurotransmitter for the sympathetic, or parasympathetic. It's that choline acts on two type of receptor. One is the anotropic receptor. The other is metapotropic receptor. The anotropic receptor is called the nicotinic Acetylcholine receptor, NSHR. This one causes the sodium influx, causing the depolarization. This neurotransmitter also responds to the nicotine. So we learned about it already. We saw its effects in the muscle. Another one is called the, another receptor is called the uh, muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, MSHR. This one is a, meta, is a, 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 a metabotropic receptor. So they don't gate an ion channel directly. However, their G protein, their alpha G, uh, G protein will activate a potassium channel. And uh, the consequence is inhibitory effects. This consequence is the uh, hyperpolarization. So that's that. So here is showing you this two as I call in, in different situation, we may see it like this one here, NACHR in the muscle. Or the uh, this is a G protein couple receptor, there's no channel here but it will activate the G protein to open the potassium channel. So this is a muscarinic receptor. And uh, it just happened to be that this one is an excitatory, this one is an inhibitor. This one that's the sodium coming in, this one that potassium going out. So that's these two. 
Now we are going to talk more about this uh, this uh, neuromuscular junction. So that's right here. This is the motor neuron. This is the axon terminal to one muscle. Release the neurotransmitter. And uh, uh, that's great. That's right here. So this is spinal cord. In the spinal cord, we have the motor neuron located in the ventral home of the spinal cord. Each nerve can innervate multiple muscle. Each muscle only has one innervation, though. So that's so, and this nerve will control the contraction of all this muscle altogether. This group muscle are called the motor units because they are all controlled by the same, by the single motor neuron. Like I'm teaching, but my kids are watching TV. <laughs> they are laughing so loud, man. Poor me. All right, so what's happening here is that when we are trying to move our muscle, our intention from our cerebral cortex will send signal into the lower motor neuron. Then this action potential will travel down here to the axon terminal. We did talk about the a lot of the process in the muscle side, but we didn't really talk about how this, some more detail about this neuron side. So that's, it's going to be uh, complete over here. So here is that action potential travel down to the axon terminal. This is presynaptic neuron. Here is the muscle. The first thing it will do is it will open a calcine channel. Then calcine coming in. The calcine will undock this vesicle. This vesicle contains the acetylcholine. Then acetylcholine will get released. I have probably another picture right here. So this is the muscle. This is the motor neuron. Action potential down here, it will open a calcium channel. So here we have a voltage gated calcium channel. Why do we need calcium? Because calcium is needed to release this vesicle. These vesicles are typically anchored on the cytoskeleton here. So they are, they need to be released. Calcium coming here can release it. Then acetylcholine will be, uh, this vesicle will conduct the uh, exocytosis to release this neurotransmitter. Binds on the acetylcholine receptor, activate a uh, amperi potential. So that's that. So that's the first thing. Action potential travel down to action to potential, travel down to the axon terminal. It will open up a calcium channel to mobilize this vesicle. Then this vesicle will reach to the membrane. In the membrane, there is a region called the active zone or dense bar. All right, guys, so I just uh, very quickly defined this picture, uh, just Google it. So show you that this is a dense bar. I don't know, maybe in your in your uh, pathology that you probably will be asked to identify this. So you can see that we have a lot of vesicles, axon terminal, here is the uh, like, like highly condensed region. So the, uh, under the, uh, electronic microscope, EM. And you can see that this is a dense bar that, so here it's dense bar. So the vesicle will get near the dense bar. Dense bar represent a highly condensed protein region. 
then we will have the this dense bar. This dense bar include one of the group of the protein is called snares protein. So here's vesicle, secretory vesicle. Then here is protein. Once uh, this protein will, will kind of like zip it, like zip it. So these two, like two pieces of the cross, they will get close to each other. Then it will be contents in that vesicle will be released. So just one example of that. One of the major protein here in the dense part is a snares protein. It's still a group of protein. So that's that. And then, and then, then, then this acetylcholine will get bind on the receptor in the post synaptic site. That part we already know. Uh, very quickly, that acetylcholine will be destroyed by acetylcholine esterase, ACHE. This one will destroy acetylcholine very quickly. Otherwise, we will have continuous stimulus from the acetylcholine. And, uh, um, and this will destroy it. And it will break this acetylcholine to form choline and uh, acetate. Acetate will be uh, metabolized, may will be floating out. Choline then, choline will be reused. Choline will then pump back. So here is a choline transporter. This is a high, like a high affinity choline transporter. It will transport the choline back to the exon terminal. This choline will be reused. Choline will bind with acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is the product from the mitochondria. Then acetyl-CoA with choline through the choline acetyl transfers to form the acetyl-choline. Acetyl-choline then pump through this vesicle as a calling transporter to the vesicle, get stored in the vesicle. And waiting for the signal, once we have the, um, sorry for the interruption. All right, so once this, uh, uh, once the action potential travel down to the axon terminal, calcium open and uh, remote mobilize this vesicle, a cycle will be released. So that's the cycle. On the post nipple side, it could be NACHR or MACHR, just some example over there. So that's that. So here we learn something quite you know interesting, and this is. Uh, it's not just only in the neuromuscular junction. This is uh, very typical in all cholinergic nerve. That's the nerve release using the acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter. So this neurotransmitter is replenished locally in the axon terminal. So you need to know that that's not like completely built or uh, like uh, the entire protein is not built in the cell body and the transport down here. So it's not like that. You need to know that their neuron, neuronal body is very far away. This is the motor neuron. Their neuronal body is right here. So it's a spinal cord and this is your fingertip. So that is far away. And uh, here we need to release the acetylcholine. And so this acetylcholine is not produced directly from the neuron, from the gene expression, from the DNA to RNA to protein. They are replenished right here. And how does it happen? They reuse the one they released 
So they release this as a coin. Once they release it, it will be reused. The way it's reu re re reused is that the as a coin is uh, is the rest. Uh, as a coin is the rest. Uh, to form coin. So coin is produced down here. Coin then get transported back to the Exxon terminal, then regenerate the asset coin. And uh, so we have the new asset coin. So we will basically that very quickly can regenerate, reproduce this asset coin locally in the Exxon terminal. One thing we do need is the mitochondria. So you, you sometimes can see that uh, we don't have the picture here, but in our neuromuscular junction, we, 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 we know that there are a lot of mitochondria down here. And the mitochondria provide the instrument to produce the acetyl So that's that. So this summarizes it. Uh, it's a coil since this is happens locally in the exon terminal. So this could be the quiz question that where is the location we synthesize the SA coil? Cell body? Nah. Exon terminal? Yes. Okay, so it's in the exon terminal. Uh, and uh, how do we synthesize it? We need two components. One is choline. Uh, choline is reused from the one that we released, right? And also we need SLCoA. SLCoA is produced by the mitochondria. SLCoA produced by the mitochondria. Then we have the, and we need an enzyme. The enzyme is calling acetyl transfers to produce the SLCoA, SLCoA. So that's that. So this figure summarizes the uh, the uh, acetylcholin in the synapses. This one we can consider. This is not just in the muscle. This is universal. This is not just for the nicotinic acetylcholin receptor. This can also apply to the muscarinic acetylcholin receptor. So this happens uh, universally. All right, so what happens is that action potential travel down to the exon terminal. This is also universal. Whenever you need to unduck a vesicle to remobilize, to mobilize this vesicle, you need to have calcium. So action potential moving down to the exon terminal opens a voltage gate, it's a calcium channel, calcium coming in. Then vesicles, vesicles are originally binding on the cytoskeleton, so they were not like moving around. They are not diffused everywhere. You can see that just by looking at this microscope, you can see that vesicles tend to locate it near the axon terminal because here they are basically uh, sit near the cytoskeleton. And so they're, they're, they will be mobilized when there is calcium coming in here. When the calcium comes in, they are mobilized and they will be captured by proteins. Protein include snares protein located uh, in the dense bar or active zone. And uh, the snare, for example, will grab it and conduct this exocytosis. So that's right here. Exocytosis, as a coin will be released by the, on the receptor, then as a coin esterase will break it to form choline and acetate. Acetate will be diffused, uh, maybe used somewhere else, but choline will be transported back to the exon terminal. Then choline will bind, will, will, uh, uh, combined with the acetylcholine produced by the mitochondria to form acetylcholine and the coil. Coil will be reused again, and the acetylcholine will be packed into the vesicle and waiting for the next signal, next action potential. So that's that.
So this is the last slide, not these, last slide for the S-Stack calling. So uh, one thing that we need to know in about the S-Stack calling, basically that this is a neurotransmitter. Uh, even though they are the, the major excitatory in the brain, the major excitatory is the glutamate, not the major inhibitory, the major inhibitory is the GABA. Acycholine is important because especially important for the physical therapy is that it controls the muscle, control the scalene muscle, it controls the heart. It's part of the parasympathetic nerve to control the heart. In the muscle, scalene muscle and the heart muscle, those are per peripheral. In the central nervous system, this is important to regulate our memory, attention, arousal. And uh, uh, the drug, the, 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 degenerate, the degeneration of this nerve has found to play an important role to cause the symptom in dementia, in particular, the Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease patient lost their memory, lost their attention, and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, so so basically that's because that their cholinergic neuron are de degenerated. It's not just the cholinergic neuron degeneration, but cholinergic neuron is part of it. And uh, so one way to treat this disease is to prolong acylcholine in the synapses. <laughs> and the way to prolong its action in the synapses is to inhibit the choline esterase or is the acylcholine esterase. So to inhibit that, and uh, then it can prevent acylcholine to be destroyed, and uh, that can be that can help to uh, like uh, eliminate the symptom. So help the patient to uh, reduce the symptom in the patients. This is not going to cure because we don't really treat, we don't really target the cause of the disease. We only work on to make the symptom become less severe. So that's that. All right, so that's the acetylcholine. The next one is the glutamate. Glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter. There are two receptors. These two are equally important. These two usually coexist in the postsynaptic site. These are the AMPA, AMPA, and the NMDA, these two. These two are the receptor of the glutamate. And these two are all excitatory. So let's look at what's these two, and why do we need why do we need to to conduct the glutamate excitatory effect? So here we have the glutamate in the post nervous side. We have these two NNDA receptor, AMPA receptor. AMPA opens a sodium channel, NMDA blocked by a magnesium. So magnesium block it. And so once when, when we magnesium block the way so and nothing can go through. Once it's removed, calcium going in, it can cause excitatory. As for NMDA though, nothing block it. So what only glutamate, only we it needs glutamate to bind on it. When glutamate binds on it, opens, sodium channel opens, going in, it causes excitatory. So these two cause excitatory. The only difference is that NMDA is blocked by magne magnesium. And how can magnesium get removed? Magnesium get removed by the voltage. So if this one, if the membrane is a little bit positive, 
then magnesium will be expelled. And to make it really positive is the opening of the MM AMPA receptor. So that's what happened. Glutamate release binds on both, and uh, it doesn't cause any effects here because magnesium block it. However, AMPA will open sodium coming in. So that's the first step. Once sodium coming in, it will cause the memory potential to become a little bit positive that expel the magnesium. So that's the first step. Then magnesium removed. This opens, calcium can come in. And the calcium, both sodium and the calcium are positive. So these two will equally cause the, will both cause the excited, excitatory effect, cause the depolarization. So that's that. So we need both. Uh, so we know that both has effects. Here, summarize what's going on. Glutamate binds on AMPA and NMDA. AMPA opens the sodium channel to cause depolarization. Depolarization expel the magnesium. Magnesium binds on the NMDA. So the depolarization cause the magnesium get expelled and allow NMDA to be activated by glutamate to allow calcium to enter. And so we have both. Uh, AMPA first, NMDA second. So NMDA raise and decay with much slower time than AMPA. And so this has several effects. One is that it will prolong the excitatory uh, uh, time. Uh, if it's only the AMPA opens, close very quickly. And uh, this one will open like two steps. Open this one first, it will trigger a next one. So the entire excitation will be prolonged. So that's one thing. The second thing is that calcium can cause a lot of post-synaptic remodeling. Uh, calcium, calcium, calcium can cause, for example, calcium coming in can bind on several modulator calcium, a lot of like cal modulin. You don't need to know all this, but it will, what it will do is it will increase the the amount of receptor. So the more calcium coming in, the more receptor will be anchored on the positive side. And that is part of the neuroplasticity, that the more you excite these circuits, the more it will generate more receptor. That will open up more channel to make this conduction even more stronger. So that's that. It will also cause the phosphorylation, P is a phosphorylation. It means that this function will become even more efficient. So the amount of calcium to flow through it will be also be enhanced. The amount of sodium to flow through it will be enhanced. So that's that. So it will increase the amount of the receptor and it also make this receptor become more effective. And that will make the synaptic conduction is become more stronger, become stronger. So that's the calcium. Calcium in many cells, as we know that the calcium amount is extremely low. So calcium is usually very low in the cell. And because because that calmodulin, for example, this, this uh, enzyme is not just happens in the nerve, it happens in many, many cells. And they can induce many cellular like uh, uh, signal transduction, uh, causing many cell effects and uh, so, so we are highly, cells highly regulate the amount of calcium in the cell. But the function of the NNDA basically provide that. It's allow calcium coming in 
And uh, by doing so, it can very quickly anchor more receptor to the positive lymph site and uh, to make this conduction become more effective. And that's how we learn. You know, if you want to repeat something, you say it 10 times. You basically memorize it for quite a long time. And that basically is the, 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 the presentation of how your NMDA responds to it and to put more receptor to it. So that's that. So that's why we need both AMPA and NMDA because AMPA is an excitatory neural, like a, a receptor, it opens sodium channel, but just by doing so, it doesn't trigger any neuroplasticity, doesn't change the nerve. NMDA can change the nerve. NMDA allow calcium coming in. That can, that calcium coming in. That calcium coming in. That can change the nerve. Okay, so that's how important. Following that, we need to know one important concept or terminology. It's called excitotoxicity. It's toxic is caused by excitation. Excitotoxicity, toxic. So what this does is that overexcitation of the nerve can cause the nerve to die. So basically, this is also part of the work by the calcium over influx of calcium will trigger apoptosis, right here, apoptosis, and uh, to kill the neuron. Neuron is very important in the brain. The reason is that they don't regenerate that easy. It's not like entirely don't regenerate, but their regeneration is very hard. The amount of neuron in our brain basically just decreasing through our, our lifetime in general. So it's only get, it's not that we are going to, has to become like a, a reduce our brain power in other way, in any way, because sometimes less is more efficient. You know, more is not necessary to be more efficient. Um, but the thing is that once the neuron die, it's very difficult to replace it. <clears throat> and uh, uh, and uh, this overexcitation, this overexcitation usually happens in the pathological condition. In the, uh, this is part of the condition. It's not that overuse your brain could cause excitotoxicity. It's not like that. It's usually is like ischemia, stroke, or uh, like schizophrenia, uh, uh, not schizophrenia, uh, epilepsy, epilepsy. Uh, the random firing in the of the signal in the brain. Uh, epilepsy can cause that, and uh, uh, and so several. They are if you're looking if you have some like uh, like uh, do research or you know are really interesting in the neuroscience you 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 should know that there are a lot of drug targeting the NMDA receptor uh, because NMDA receptor uh, calcium coming in 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 many disease it will induce the excitotoxicity. This is not the primary cause of death, but this is kind of like secondary cause of the cell death. So that's that. This is also a quick question. Uh, influx of what can cause excitotoxicity? Something like that. All right, so that's that. And the very last one is the GABA receptor. GABA neurotransmitter is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, in the spinal cord. And uh, it has two types of receptor. One is GABA-A, the other one is GABA-B. GABA-A, and both are inhibitory. 
GABA A is an ionotropic. It opens the chloride channel right here. Chloride flow in to cause the hyperpolarization. GABA B is a metabotropic receptor. G protein opens the potassium channel, potassium flow out. It also causes the hyperpolarization. So that's that. So GABA A, GABA B, A is, uh, this is basically this slide is quiz question, right? GABA A is open chloride, GABA A is anotropic, GABA B is metabotropic, open the potassium. So that's that. All right. Then we are going to talk about this one, glia cell. So before we talk about neuron, we talk about several major functions of the neuron. Now we are going to talk about another group of cells. Those are the glia cells. Okay. So glia cells are three types. Uh, Myelin, exercise, and the microglia. Myelin form the myelin sheets. Two type myelin cells, oligodendrocytes and the strong cells. They form myelin. So here is the axon wrapped by the myelin. It's not entirely wrapped. You can see that myelin, 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 but there is a space open not wrapped by myelin. This is called node of Ronville. Myelin is not permeable to ion. Myelin basically is the membrane wrapped around and around and around. So like that. So here, for example, this is cell and extended membrane, membrane just wrapped around cell body, just wrapped around this axon. So you can see this one has multiple layer of phospholipid. So this basically myelin is full of the lipid, phospholipid, phospholipid, layer after layer of the phospholipid wrapped around the axon. So myelin development requires essential fatty acids. And that's why the kids, you know, uh, formula is very important to provide the essential fatty acids because kids, their brain continue to develop uh, up to maybe 12, 16 years old. So nutrients in that period of time is very important. It affects their intelligence. It affects their brain function, brain development, okay. All right, so with this one, we know that oligodendrocytes, strong cell different in a way that strong cell one myelin wrapped around one axon. In the ordinary, in the central nervous system, one myelin cell wrapped around multiple axon. So it forms this bundle. So we have this Y meter tracks. That's a bundle of axons. This one showing you that this is myelin. Myelin basically is wrapped around this extension of the cell body. And so you can see this could be the, can be viewed as the layer of layer of phospholipids and the cholesterol. So a lot of lipid. Also they don't wrap entirely. We have these nodes of Ronville. So nodes of Ronville is one that axon uh, ex exposed to the extracellular space this region uh, featured with low threshold for an action potential and a high density of voltage gated sodium channel. So remember that, uh, I don't have the drawing here, do I? Do I have a drawing here? Drawing, okay. So I hope I can do this one here because I actually don't have a, I'm at home, so I don't actually have a, device, but I will try. So basically you remember that action potential, right? Pretty good, so far so good. All right, so this is the action potential. This one is what? Depolarization, right? This one is repolarization. Hang on, hang on, let me pause a little bit. All 
All right, so this is an action potential. Action potential has two major phases, depolarization and the repolarization. So what's in the depolarization? What caused the depolarization? It's a voltage-gated calcium, voltage-gated soda, sodium channel, right? So it's right here, voltage-gated sodium channel. So that's that, that's right here. So this is voltage-gated sodium channel. So that's this one. And so to trigger an action potential, you need to have voltage-gated sodium channel, as well as voltage-gated potassium channel. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, for the, uh, once we have the action potential, if we don't have anything, this will propagate, right? Propagate, as we already know, propagate. However, you must know that that propagation will gradually decay. You flip here, say, uh, you, your, your inference, this action potential cause that that propagation will gradually decay. And in the end, it will become no effect. So, even in a non-marinated axon, you need to have a voltage-gated sodium channel right here in order to re-energize it. So basically that here, join, you have an action potential in the beginning right here. This one is caused by sodium channel open, potassium channel open, right? And this one, if there's nothing, if there is no action potential, if there is no sodium channel, it will gradually decay. You need to energize, you need to reignite it before it's lower than threshold. So here you need to have a sodium channel again. This is above the threshold, so it will trigger another action potential. And the, it's like every other action potential, it will gradually, every other like potential voltage, it will gradually decay. And so you need to have another one here. Sodium channel, it will re-energize it, reignite it again, like that. And uh, and so, so, so here, uh, it, here is all here. Jumping this way, jumping this way, okay. So say we have an action potential. It will come in here. It will decay a little bit. But this region full with sodium channel. So this one can generate very quickly, generate an action potential. And the, this one has a low threshold, a low threshold. So that even though the signal decayed, here, the threshold is lower, so it can still, in other places, they probably can't, this probably cannot uh, trigger an action potential. Here, it can trigger an action potential, trigger an action potential. So that's the feature of the nodes of Rambio. We will find their high density of voltage gated sodium channel and the low threshold. So that's that. I like this, I like this drawing, pretty good. All right then, so that's the Marim. The next important one is the astrocyte. Uh, even though that's without brain is the neuron nervous system, but the amount of glial cell actually is more than the number of the neurons. Half of the nerve in Half of the cell in the brains are astrocytes. Not mentioned that we also have marine cells, we have microglia cells. So, so even though that neuron is the first identified as the major cells who conduct signal in the brain, these glial cells are over all number than the neuronal cells. All right, astrocytes. Exercise is very important. Exercise in a way that, one thing is important, you need to know that the shape is like star. Okay, so it's like multiple processes. 
touching on different part of the brain. What's its function? Its function has so many. So it's not, we cannot even use one phrase to summarize it, to call it. Martin cell, easy, it's Martin. Microglia is easy, it's macrophage. Exercise, there are a lot of functions. It can be the one to nourish the neuron, meaning that it feeds neuron. Quite interesting, right? Regulate capillary. So we need to know that in the brain, the blood vessel has very tight junction, as we already know in, when we talk about the vascular system, that capillary have different uh, like permeability. Uh, in some organ, this capillary can be very open, like a lot of space, uh, uh, permeability to let fluids moving in and out. But in the brain, these capillary are highly controlled. That mm, virus, virus could probably could, but bacteria uh, cannot get into the brain, okay? So it's very highly controlled. And so it regulates, that is regulated by the exercise. It regulates neurotransmitter, so it regulates. Interesting, right? We talk about the neurotransmitter. Why do we talk about the neurotransmitter? Glutamate, the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, and that is regulated by exercise. It regulates, by doing so, it regulates, it modulates the synaptic signal. So, so a typical exercise, as you can see here, it has many process, it process connect, several process connect with the cell, with the nose rhombial, with the capillary. So it control the blood brain barrier. So here is a picture of this is capillary in general. It has fenestration. It has the interstellar spaces. In the brain though, it has tight junction. So it, it connected very tightly. Not only so, it's enforced. This barrier is enforced by two other cells. Uh, parasite and also the exercise. So this is one and feeds from the exercise. It control the blood brain barrier. So in order to let it open, let things go through it, it has to get the permission from the exercise. So this is the endo, endothelium, single endothelium cell in the capillary. So that's that. So exercise control the blood brain barrier. Exercise also, I like this picture. I try to find a good picture to represent the function of the exercise. This probably is the one that's the best. So here we show two major function of the exercise. One is nu nutrition. So as we mentioned here, nourishing neurons. How does it do? So here we get glucose from the vessel. So that's a nutrition, right? You need nutrition. now. Glucose convert to the lactate in the exercise. Then exercise feed this lactate into the neuron. Neuron then use this lactate to generate ATP. Here, neurons can also take the glucose by itself. We know that there is a several type of glucose transporter. Uh, in the neuron, we have GLUT3. So that is insulin-independent glucose transporter. And so neuron can take glucose by itself, but neuron also get fuel from the exercise. So that's the part that exercise nourishing nerve. So that's that, that's how I like it. All right, so we know that exercise nourishing nerve. So that's one thing. Another thing is that neurotransmitter regulation is right here. So this is a glucose 
sorry, glutamate. Glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter. It will, once it's released, so this is not as that calling. We didn't really spend time talking about how glucose get reused or recycled. But here we get the sense that very much like acetylcholine, they are recycled in the exon terminal. So glutamates will get pumped back to the exercise. Then exercise convert that glutamate to glutamine. And the glutamine will be transported into the exon terminal, then convert into the glutamate to be used again. So if we, if you are, if you if you still have like fresh like uh, fresh memory, we know that similarly, acetylcholine have the same mechanism. Acetylcholine got released, binds on it, break into the choline. Choline get reused to rebuild this acetylcholine. So this neurotransmitter is replenished locally in the axon terminal. And here in the glutamate, we learned, we, we now know that this glutamate is also replenished locally in the exon terminal by the help of the astrocytes. So that regulate the glutamate. Uh, what else? Yeah, so that is how this is exercise important to nourishing neuron provide the lactate, regulate capillary, as we mentioned here, regulate the capillary, regulate neurotransmitter, pump the glutamate, glutamate the excitatory neurotransmitter, so this one can, and also by doing so, can modulate the synaptic signal. So this one basically can control the time that glutamate remain in the synapses. The longer it is, the longer it can excite the postsynaptic side. So that's that. So that's the actual side. In the end, we will talk about this one, the last one. This is the microglia. So microglia is easy. You just need to know that it's a macrophage. This is tissue uh, resident macrophage. There are several tissue resident macrophage. Basically the monocytes is the one in the blood that's one to serve as the phagocytosis, right? And they will migrate into the tissue. Sometimes they reside in the tissue and they have different name in the brain. One thing unique though, is that remember we have tight blood brain barrier. So the monocytes basically cannot do it when they form the tight blood-brain barrier. Monocytes cannot migrate because this is very tightly regulated. Cell would not go through. So this cell goes through only when the brain is not fully differentiated. So in the infant, then this uh, uh, monocytes has a chance to go into the brain, then they stay there and they form this, they become this microglia. So we know that here is the uh, uh, the uh, embryo development, right? Embryo development from the fertilized egg to the infant, right? And uh, through the early, like maybe uh, during the first week, we start to form, this is called the, uh, I forgot. <laughs> Blastocyte, something like that, all right, anyway. So here, Blasto, let me. Yeah, it's a Blastocyst. It's right here, breast peristura, breast cyst. All right, so, breast cyst. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, the stem cell will be divided into three germline and uh, and each germline develop into different organ nerve from are from all these neuronal cells exercise marine cells are all belong to the ectodermal lineage however the microglia even though they are part of the brain they are derived from this mesodermal lineage so that's how these two are very different from each other so this summarizes the neural cellular physiology and uh, and uh, uh, next one, we will start to move on to the uh, uh, nervous system uh, extend from this cell to form this different nervous system. So this one showing you the like entire uh, system this nervous system include the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system include brain spinal cord. Peripheral basically out of the uh, dura mater are the peripheral. The difference is that here we have the Schwann cell as the mounting cell. The central nervous system we have the uh, the oligodendrocytes. Here we have very tight brain barrier. And the peripheral nerve system indicate that this nerve interact with non nerve, including muscle, nerve with muscle, or nerve with outside world, or nerve with other environmental signal. So that's a sensory. So it will have two branches sensory and the motor. In the motor, we include the skeletal muscle, this one we talked about. It also includes the autonomic. This is also motor. Control the motor movement. Here, control what motor? What muscle? This one control the smooth muscle and the skeletal muscle. Sorry, smooth, smooth muscle and the cardiac myocyte. So we talk about this one. We use the cardiovascular system to describe the autonomic nervous system. Not complete, but basically that you get the idea that how nerve control smooth muscle and the cardiac muscle right here here we talk about the skeletal muscle so this combined all together are the motor nervous system this one we spend a lot of time right we basically talk about the muscle first then today we complete it to talk more about the nerve portion the neuromuscular junction nerve side of that neuromuscular junction so we complete that little piece of the puzzle. So everything is completed here. Following that, we will talk about the sensory. We will talk about, following this lecture, we will start to talk about the dorsal root ganglion sensory. So this is somatic sensory. We will talk about the somatic sensory. We will also talk about pain. So that's this one here. We will also then talk about the cranial nerve sensory. So this one includes everything like vision, uh, auditory, uh, everything like that. Okay. We will choose, if we have time, depending on time, we will probably choose some to talk about. Uh, so that's a sensory. We then we will talk because we need to more focusing on the motor that's more relevant to the physical therapy. We will then talk about the central nervous system and we will focus on how central nervous system affects the motor portion. So that's basically our plan. All right, so that's that. And uh, let me know if you have any question. I hope this one give you a good like summary review and also with some depth into the 
cellular neurocellular physiology. All right.